I'd like for you to take the Word of God with me, please, and open it in the Old Testament to the book of Exodus, chapter number 8. Exodus, chapter number 8. And we will find here a most familiar story, a most unusual story in the Word of God. This, of course, is the story of God dealing with Pharaoh and dealing with Egypt uh, to let his people go. Uh, it uh, spans a number of chapters and several phases in this journey. But I draw your attention to this particular section, the second of the plagues, the plague of frogs. It is a fascinating story. How many of you like frogs? Would you raise your hand? There's always a few strange people in every congregation, and now you know who they are. When God sent the frogs, this was, it was not a good thing. As a matter of fact, if you read all the way through to the very end of the chapter, when the frogs are gone, there are so many of them that they... They make mountains out of them. There are literally hills, mounds of dead, decaying frogs. And I want you to know that stinks. That's not a pleasant thing. This was not God sending pets into the land of Egypt. This was God sending a plague. And it was a horrible one. But here's the context. Look at Exodus chapter 8 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord... Let my people go that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house and into thy bedchamber and upon thy bed and into the house of thy servants and upon thy people and into thine ovens and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee and upon thy people and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses... Say unto Aaron, stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. May I pause our reading just for a moment and cause you to look at verse number 7. You know, sinners aren't thinking clearly, are they? You ever do something really ignorant and you think when you look back on it, why on earth? They got enough frogs. God sent frogs to cover the land of Egypt. And just to prove that they could do it too, they bring forth even more frogs. You have to think the God of heaven must have laughed at their foolishness, multiplying this plague upon themselves. Look at verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me. And from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee in thy houses that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. I want you to circle in verse 10 that word. What a dumb answer. Tomorrow. You have to wonder what was going through Pharaoh's mind, don't you? Years ago, I had the opportunity to be in Cairo, Egypt for two or three days. And uh, it was fascinating to see the Nile and lots of interesting things you read about in Scripture. But they took us to the Museum of Cairo. And it was one of the most amazing buildings I've ever walked through because you're walking through not hundreds of years of history, but thousands and thousands of years of history. We came into a certain room. It was not a very large room. But when we came into the room, we found a strange sight. There were, if I remember correctly, three or four mummified bodies lying in that room. They were still perfectly wound up except for their head. And they had unwound the cloth around their head and you could see the facial features of these men and their hair. It's amazing how preserved their, their bodies were after so many thousands of years. And the guide said to us, these are pharaohs. And then he walked over to two of them and he said, we're not sure exactly which one of these, but one of these two was pharaoh during the period of Moses and the Exodus. 
He kind of said it flippantly and moved on and the group moved on and I stood there looking at those two for a moment and I almost felt sorry for the fellow. I didn't know exactly which one it was, but I looked at him and I thought, buddy, you went through it. I mean, you had something to deal with in life. I'm looking at the man that Moses stood before when he said, God said, let my people go. Ten plagues in all, but this is the second, the plague of the frogs. I have to tell you that all the plagues are terrible. This one is terrible. But the response of Pharaoh in this one seems so totally insane, illogical. By the way, there is a miserable insanity to sin. You don't believe me? Ask the prodigal son. When people get away from God and harden their hearts, they don't think right. You ever watch somebody and they do something really, really uncharacteristic and you say, what were they thinking? The answer is they weren't thinking right. They weren't thinking like they ought to think reasonably because something has happened to their hearts. Moses says, I'll pray for you and God will take the frogs away. When would you like for me to pray for you? Now, if I had been asked that question of in Pharaoh, I'd have said yesterday, get these frogs out of here. Or this moment, Moses, let's stop right here and now and you pray to the God of heaven that the frogs will go away. But instead, it seems without any hesitation, he says, tomorrow be fine. Tomorrow? One old preacher had a famous sermon he preached called One More Night with the Frogs. He suggested that perhaps he'd grown affectionate towards them and named them and wanted to be around them for one. I have no idea why he did what he did. But this much I do know. We do the same thing. You know, we're all so proud that we look at the sins of others and we spot them immediately. And we say, I would never do that. Pharaoh, what's wrong with you? Well, maybe I could phrase it a little different way. Is there any sin in your life that the Holy Spirit has convicted you of? And instead of confessing and forsaking it, you've said, I'll do that, but I'll do that tomorrow. Is there any decision that while the pastor of this church has been preaching the word of God faithfully to us, the Lord himself has put his finger on something in your life and said, you need to do that. And you have said, yes, tomorrow. Is there any call that God's placed on your life that you've determined you're going to answer, you're just not going to do it today, you're going to do that tomorrow? Any relationship that needs to be repaired and you have full intention, the best of intentions of getting it right and making it right, but you just haven't done it yet because tomorrow may be a better day to do that. You see, the reality is we all have the Pharaoh complex. We all think that on some more convenient tomorrow, it'll get easier. There are people that sit in meetings like this for years, years they sit in meetings like this, convicted that they're not even saved. They know they're not saved. They have nagging doubts and and the concerns about their eternal soul. And they don't plan to go to hell. Look, nobody plans to go to hell. Everybody's going to try to get something right before their life is over, but they just keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off until tomorrow. I'm speaking on this subject, the devil's word. You know, the devil has a lot of words, doesn't he? And by the way, may I remind you that the devil is a liar and the father of it. Which means when he speaks, he cannot speak the truth. No, even when he takes the truth, he twists the truth. He wrangles it around like he did with Eve until it serves his own purposes. And I tell you that tomorrow is the devil's work. As a matter of fact, it's not only one of the devil's words, I think it is one of his favorite words. Did you know that hell is populated with people that were going to get saved tomorrow? And earth is filled with wasted lives that intended to start doing the right thing on a tomorrow. 
See, the devil's not going to tell you, don't do that, don't listen to God, don't obey the truth. No, he's not going to do that. What he's going to say is, you really ought to do that. Won't you do that tomorrow? Remember as a little boy growing up, my dad preaching one Sunday. I remember it very distinctly. He preached on 12 hours to live. I've never forgotten the message. And he asked that evening, what would you do if you knew you had 12 hours left to live on this earth? That week, a lady came to our home, a lady that was serving in the church and faithful and active, and she said, I want to meet with my parents. They met. I had no idea what it was about. But soon, we all knew there was something in this woman's life that was not what it ought to be. She came clean with God. She came clean with her family. She actually stood in front of our church because of the nature of the thing and confessed what she had done and repented. There were consequences to deal with. There were terrible things that had to be addressed. But it was this one thought that she could not escape. Well, what if I only had 12 hours to live? Could I ask you a question? What if tomorrow never comes? What if the devil's word to you really is a lie and there will not be a tomorrow? Yesterday. Yesterday I was talking to a man about his soul. I told my wife last night, he seemed so intent. He, he really was, he was a businessman. He was from another city, but he seemed so intent on what I was talking about. And, and to be honest with you, that doesn't happen all the time. Usually you're trying to engage them and you're trying to draw them in. And I, I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. He was a religious man, but not, not saved, no assurance of salvation. In a matter of moments, we, we looked at the scriptures and he asked questions and we interacted and he bowed his head and he prayed and asked Christ to be a savior. And then he looked at me and he said this. He said, sir, you don't know me. He said, I wasn't supposed to be in this seat today. We were on an airplane. He said, I wasn't supposed to be in this seat today. He said, but I got moved to this seat right before this flight. He said, then when I got on, he said, I realized I was sitting in the wrong seat, but I stayed here. He said, I think maybe I was supposed to be in this seat. Amen. I said, I think so too. And then he said to me, I've just been told I don't have long to live. Middle-aged man. He said, I have kidney cancer. And he said, the doctors have only given me a certain amount of time and my own children don't know it yet. But he said, my mother's been praying for me. He said, I can't wait to tell her about our conversation. He said, I think I, when we get off the plane, I'm going to go ahead and call my wife and tell her what happened today. I said, I think that'd be a great thing to do. And I walked off, I walked away from the man and I thought, isn't that amazing? I mean, here this man, who knows how many tomorrows he has left, but... God let him hear the gospel today so he could be saved. And the Holy Spirit of God brought such conviction to my heart. Because the truth is, every person you come in contact with is unsure of tomorrow. And we have this crazy notion that, well, if a man's got a terminal illness, well, he really needs the gospel. Look, please, you don't know who is nearest hell today. Those nearest hell may be those sitting in a church pew. Those nearest hell may be those that you see every day. All around us, people are dying and perishing and moments of time are ticking off. Today will soon be over and tomorrow may never come and the devil's word is just a lie to keep men from the truth of Jesus Christ. What is this? devilish word tomorrow I would say to you first of all that the word tomorrow is a word of pride it's pride Pharaoh was full of himself pompous and proud worshipped by everyone as if he was a god he wasn't going to bend the knee to god and so he says yeah maybe I'll do that but maybe I'll do that tomorrow let me tell you the kind of pride that is. It's the pride that says that I know better than God does what should be done today. 
Isn't it interesting how we all plan our lives out? And we've got our schemes and our schedules and our agendas. Friend, let me ask you a question. What if the creator of the universe wanted to interrupt your plan? What if your time frame doesn't work with his? Because God's ways are higher than our ways. And God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And God has his own timetable. God's eternal. He's not in time. Time is in God. God holds time in the, in the palm of his hand. He's not bound by time. So when he's working, he's not working for time. He's working his eternal purposes. And maybe the way we've scheduled it out isn't right at all. I would tell you Pharaoh's problem was not a scheduling problem. It was a stubborn problem. He was proud. As a matter of fact, turn over one page. Look at chapter number 10 and verse number 3. This is later in this story. But look at Exodus 10 verse 3. Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews. Now watch the question. How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? It was his pride. By the way, that's a pretty good question. How long? How long will you resist the Holy Spirit? How long will you say, God, you're right, but not now? How, how long will you put off to tomorrow what you ought to do today? Because every time we say tomorrow to God, we're confessing that we know better than he does what ought to be done today. And I want to remind you that God always knows better than we do. You know what tomorrow is? Tomorrow is another way of saying no. And today is another way of saying yes. When God speaks to me and I say, today, I've said, yes, Lord. And when God speaks to me and I say, mm, tomorrow, somebody says, that's just delay. No, no, that's denial. That's no. And it's a word of pride. And can I tell you, it may not be frogs, but God will bring something across your path that brings you low. Maybe many things. To bring you to the end of yourself. You know, I, I was thinking the other day, I think God has spent an awful lot of time in my life just trying to humble me. To get me low enough that he could bless and that he could speak to me. Because all of us are so full of ourselves and our own plans and our own ideas about what is right that we miss today what God has put right in front of us. I'll give you a second thing. Tomorrow, the devil's word is not only a word of pride, it is also a word of procrastination. Oh, we have the best of intent and we know it's right, but we think maybe I'll just do that another day. My dad had a friend years ago that had a little poem he quoted often, so often that I memorized it. He would say this, Procrastination is my sin. It causes me endless sorrow. I really must stop doing it. In fact, I'll start tomorrow. Kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? See, most of us who procrastinate and put things off, we know it's not right. We just think we'll have another chance. And I'll tell you something that reading through the book of Exodus recently, the Lord arrested me with, because we always go straight to these 10 plagues, and it's just like God is just punching the fire out of Pharaoh and Egypt and deflating them and bringing them down to the end of themselves. But did you ever notice that God gave them an opportunity before the plague started? Turn back one page in your Bible to chapter 7 for a moment of Exodus. Look at Exodus chapter 7, verse 10. This is before the plagues. And Moses and Aaron went in into Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. The world's always trying to substitute and imitate something. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. I like this, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Look, the world can offer you some cheap imitation of something for a little while, but in the end, God is greater. Look at verse 13. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Can I tell you how God works with us? He speaks in soft, tender tones first. He whispers. He whispers. He speaks to us in loving, tender tones, and he says, surely they'll listen to me. And when we do not respond in soft tones, 
Sometimes the Lord has to use more severe tones to get our attention. Growing up, if my mama said, Scott, I knew a certain tone. How many of you understand what I mean? There was a certain lilt to it. It just wasn't, you know, baby cakes, I want to hug you and tell you I love you. It was, I want you front and center right now. And if I didn't listen to that, the worst, the worst sound in our home growing up was Christopher Scott Pauly. Those, it was a bad thing. It was not good. I had waited too long to respond. Could I ask you something? How many todays have you wasted planning for tomorrow? How many, look please, how many this moment have you missed planning to do that tomorrow? The will of God, look please, the will of God is not future. The will of God is always present tense. Young people think, out there somewhere, I'm going to get serious. No, you won't. No, you won't. The night I surrendered to preach, I was 12. I was scared out of my mind. And the old preacher put his arm around me out in the lobby, and he said, so God's called you to be a preacher. I said, yes, sir. He said, that's great. Get your first sermon together. You're going to preach next week in a cottage prayer meeting. I said, wait a minute. Let's talk about this thing for a second. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, young man, he got right in my face. He said, young man, if you don't start serving God now, you probably never will. Some of you, if you don't get saved today, tomorrow's probably never going to come for you. You've been away from the Lord. You've been putting it off. You don't get right with God today. Tomorrow may never come for you. There's no promise of tomorrow. Not for any of us. This week, we've heard about young people going into eternity. This week, we've heard about people who are, who are not old people who left this world. Look, not a single one of us has any promise of tomorrow. May I ask you something? Why do you think God lets you live today? Somebody your age died last night. So why did God let you live to this moment? I suggest to you because there is something today that God wants you to do. Look, there's no rewind button in life. There's no fast forward button in life. It doesn't work that way. Somebody said yesterday is like a canceled check. Tomorrow is like a promissory note and today is all that's legal tender. They meant by that you can't go back and change the past and you can't jump to the future and plan all the details out. All you can do is make the most of this moment that God has let you live. Stop listening to the devil's word when it comes to eternal things. Proverbs 27 verse 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. I'll tell you this, if I was a Christian and I never get, hadn't been baptized, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd get baptized as quickly as I could. If I wasn't a member of a New Testament church like this, I would join as quickly as I could. You say, why? Because any moment the Lord could come, and when the Lord comes, I would want to say, I have been as obedient as I knew to be. Whatever was the next step for me, Lord, when you showed it to me, I didn't hesitate. I didn't put it off. I did it. Look, when the Lord comes, and by the way, don't you just hope the Lord comes in our lifetime and not a one of us has to go through the gate of death. We all just go together at the trumpet. That'd be glorious, wouldn't it? But when the Lord comes, either way, and we stand before him, we're all going to have a lot of things left undone. But I want you to know, if God has already prompted you about something, you'll have no excuse on that day because you have today to do it. There's a third truth I'd like to give you. The devil's word tomorrow is not only a word of pride and a word of procrastination, it's a word of presumption. It's presumptuous to say tomorrow. Why? Because tomorrow may never get here. And if it does, let's say hypothetically, tomorrow does come. Tomorrow the sun comes up just like it did today. Tomorrow you wake up just like you did today. Tomorrow you start your your sequence of Monday events just like you did last Monday. Tomorrow it all just goes on like always. That's what the world says, you see. Let's presume for a moment that that does happen tomorrow. Can I tell you that tomorrow you won't be the same as you are today? See, tomorrow you may not want the same things you want right now. Tomorrow you may have hardened your heart like Pharaoh did. Tomorrow the circumstances may be totally different. And oh, by the way, tomorrow the devil will still be saying tomorrow. You know what's interesting to me? 
Pharaoh was the first to use this word in this context in this passage of Scripture. But after he says it in Exodus chapter 8 and verse number 10, God starts using the word back on Pharaoh. Let me show you what I mean. Look in chapter 8 again at verse number 23. Here's the next plague. It's the plague of flies. God says in Exodus chapter 8 verse 23, And I will put a division between my people and thy people. What's the next word, church? Tomorrow shall this sign be. Uh, Skip over again. Look at verse number 29. Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Look at chapter 9, verse 5. And the Lord appointed a time, a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. That was the disease upon the cattle. Look at verse number 18. Here's the hail. Behold, Tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. Look at chapter 10, verse 4. Here's the locust. Else if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locust into thy coast. Fascinating, isn't it? Pharaoh says one word to God. Pharaoh says, I'll do it tomorrow. By the way, he didn't. And every plague thereafter, God says to him, Pharaoh, it's coming tomorrow. It's almost like the Lord just said, I'll take Pharaoh's word and make sure he remembers it. Would you look at me for a moment, please? In some Christless hell, the word tomorrow will ring in the ears of people who heard the gospel and did not accept it. In some empty future, In some old age of life, this word tomorrow rings in the ears of men and women who have wasted the God-given opportunity that they had. I tell you it is a word of presumption to say, tomorrow I'll take care of that. Look, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And I submit to you this day, if the devil's word is tomorrow, God's word is tomorrow. Today, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Hebrews said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Look, Jesus looked at a man hanging next to him on a cross at Calvary. What did he say to him? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I tell you, the work of God and the will of God and the word of God is today. Whatever it is you're supposed to do, do it now. Do it quickly. By the way, that was God's lesson to Israel in all of this. Let me show you what happened on their last day. Turn over to chapter 12 for just a moment. Look at Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 11. He's instituting the Passover. They're about to rise up and pack their bags and get out of Dodge. They're about to leave Egypt. And look at what God's last word to them is. Exodus chapter 12 verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it, mark this in your Bible, in haste. What you do, do it quickly. It is the Lord's Passover. Look at verse number 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. God said, my will is today. My will is this day, right now, in haste. Do it quickly. And if you'll do it today, you'll remember it and rejoice in it for all the generations to come. Look, you want tomorrow to be a good day? Then make today a good day with God. You want your tomorrow to be blessed? Then today you get serious about your walk with the Lord. You want tomorrow to know God's blessing upon your family and on the next generation? Then today take some different action in your home to set that in motion. Today is God's word to us. And I leave you with one closing scripture. I'd like for you to turn in the New Testament to the book of James, chapter number four. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit of God Beautifully connects Exodus chapter 8 and James chapter number 4 with these powerful words. A divine exclamation point. What is God's word to us today? James chapter 4 and verse number 13. Go to now. Ye that say, watch these next three words. 
four words, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, your, your pride, your procrastination, your presumption. Ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We quote that last verse a lot, don't we? But the context of it is, what are you going to do today? See, the world lives this way. Oh, today or tomorrow, they're all the same. What's one more day in the great scheme of things? I'll tell you what it is. It's a day lost forever. It's a day we will never recapture. It's a day that we will never have again. Excuse me, church, but there is no do-over button in life. And when it's gone, it's gone forever. Queen Mary loved Scotland. She took an annual holiday there, a vacation there, and the people of Scotland loved her. As a matter of fact, Mary was so at home in Scotland and so loved by the people, she walked about in towns where she was without a protective escort, which was unheard of for the queen, but she felt totally at ease there. One afternoon, she took a walk with a group of children through the Scottish countryside, and they got a little far away from town and some black clouds came over the horizon. In a matter of moments, a huge thunderstorm had moved in and torrential downpours had started and she was without shelter. She went to a nearby cottage, a house, and she knocked on the door and the woman of the house opened the door and saw this woman standing there soaking wet, but she didn't recognize her as the queen. The queen said to her, Ma'am, could I trouble you for an umbrella? If you're a lonely one, I'll, I'll bring it back to you tomorrow. And the woman thought for a moment and she said, I have a new one, but I'm not giving away my new one to this stranger. I got one out back that I'm about to throw away. I'll give that one away. It doesn't matter whether I ever see that again. And she went to the back porch and she picked up an old tattered umbrella with rips in it and one of the ribs broken. And she brought it to the front and she handed it to the queen. The queen thanked her and made the best of the tattered umbrella and put it up and went on her way. And the next day... There was another knock at the same woman's door. When she opened the door, there stood the queen's royal guard, the old tattered umbrella in his hand. With a smile on his face, he handed it back to the woman of the house and he said, Ma'am, the queen sends her greatest appreciation and thanks you for your kindness. The woman was stunned, of course. And then, while the guard stood before her, she broke down and began to weep. They said these were the words she spoke. Oh, I have wasted my opportunity. I did not give my best to the queen. I think someday an awful lot of us are going to stand before the Lord Jesus and say, oh, I have wasted my opportunity. I did not give my best to the king. And I tell you, if you want to rejoice with the king tomorrow, then do what he wants you to do today.